each time I finish building a ski waxing stand, I think there are still improvements to be made. The L-Cubed Ski wax o matic is designed to be lighter, use less wood, and be lower cost. For this stand, I'm also trying to cut down on the tools being used so that it's more practical for more people to build but still be an interesting project. My objectives for this build are to reduce cost, use the minimum amount of wood, use standard dimension hardwood, find a cheaper sawhorse for support, not use the bandsaw, and not use the stack dado head. Using the minimum amount of wood will help to reduce cost, but I'm also planning a design that doesn't use the T-bolt track because it adds about $20 to the cost. I started off with a plan, but as I progressed through the build, I changed my approach significantly. This is the design I ended up with, and I think it works well and meets the objectives for the build. For the wood, I decided I wanted the stand to be made from a single 5.5 inch by 3 quarter inch by 8 foot board, which are readily available. Since I have a thickness planer, I'm going to buy my wood from my local hardwood supplier and plane it to the thickness, but you can purchase an 8 foot board from your typical home building supply stores. To reduce cost, I'm going to buy 4 foot short lengths, and since I'm buying two pieces, I'm going to buy one maple and one cherry but that's just because I like the look of the wood mixed together. To start, I ripped the wood into two and a quarter inch strips on the table saw and then cut them to length using the miter saw. My previous build, I did two and a half inch wide strips. That's what I was using to support the skis and the rest of everything else was the same width, but I found that two and a quarter, which I did on the very first builds, seemed to work a little bit better and was more appropriate for the skis. While I was at the miter saw, I also cut 45 degree angles on the support arms. Next, I prepared to cut the slots in the top of the support arms where the ski supports will connect to the arms and pivot. In trying to minimize the number of tools I'm using, I decided to hand cut the slots using a dovetail saw and then remove the remaining wood with a chisel. This worked okay, however if the cuts aren't exactly square to the face of the arm, it means that the ski support won't align or pivot properly. So for the second arm, I ended up cutting it on the table saw using a regular blade but it did require that I use a jig which allowed me to run the wood through the blade while the piece of wood was standing on its end. I still had to do the clean out of the extra wood with a chisel. Once I had pivot arms ready for fitting to the sliding bases, I drilled and countersunk screw holes and then I clamped the parts to a piece of melamine so that I had a true flat surface to work on. I'm hoping that this helps to give me a better chance of everything being square when I'm done. I drilled pilot holes for the screws which is usually required when working with hardwood like maple. I could now do a test fit by putting in the screws, and everything seemed to work well. The next challenge was creating a slot in the sliding base. Since I'm not using the T-track with the sliding T-bolts this time, the T-bolts will be stationary so the bases need to have the slots in order to allow adjustment of length. A plunge router would probably be a good tool for this, but I'm trying to minimize the tools used, so I decided to remove most of the wood using a brad point drill on the drill press. I clamped a piece of wood to the table to act as a fence so that it was easy to have all the holes in a straight line. While this approach was effective at removing most of the wood, it left a pretty rough slot, so I had to figure out how to clean it up. I decided I could do most of this work using the table saw and a regular ripping blade. This is a rather delicate operation, but it did most of the cleanup I needed. The last little bit of cleanup was done with a chisel. Now it's time to make the ski supports. This hasn't really changed since the first design. I like to have a fair bit of the ski tip curve supported, so I need more thickness at the end of the ski support to make room for the curve. Because I'm trying to do this without using the bandsaw, I'm going to use the belt sander to remove the excess wood from the curve. As a result, I wanted to minimize the amount of wood I had to sand, so I mitered one of the pieces and staggered them when I was gluing them together. Once the glue had dried, I traced the ski curve onto the wood and was ready to sand it to match the ski's curve profile. After I finished sanding with 60 grit sandpaper, I increased the grit until I was at 120 and had a decent smooth finish. I actually forgot to cut off the bottom part of the tip until I had the whole stand finished, which meant going back to cut it, sand it, and finish it after I thought I was done everything. Before doing the final glue up assembly, I finished all the pieces with three coats of varnish that are rubbed down with number 40 steel wool. 
I applied glue to the sliding bases and support arms and put the screws back into the holes that I had previously drilled, and then I let the glue dry. While the glue was drying, I started working on adding the cork to the ski supports. I cut strips of cork to the size of the supports, then applied contact cement to both the cork and the wood ski support. As soon as the cork and wood came into contact, the cement sets, so you have to have it lined up exactly right before you put them together. The last step for the ski supports is to attach the pivot blocks to the bottom. In my previous designs, I cut a slot in the bottom using a stacked dado head on the table saw, but for this build, the pivot points are attached with glue and screws. Three screws and glue are probably overkill, but better safe than sorry. With the ski supports ready to go, they're bolted to the pivot arms using a machine screw, washer, and locking nut. The final component that needs assembly is the center binding locking post. To make this, I start out with a nail that fits the binding of the ski. Previously, I used a hacksaw to take the head off the nail, but I decided this time to use an angle grinder. It was noisier, but faster, and it makes cool sparks. A file is used to clean up the end and remove the point from the other end of the nail. For some reason, I forgot to video the rest of the process of creating the center binding locking post, but essentially, I cut and sanded some pieces of wood that were about the right size and dry fitted everything together and did a test fit with a ski. When I first assembled it, the arms were too long so the ski wasn't very tight when the center locking post was tightened down. The ski moved when I started waxing. So I shortened the arms and re-drilled them and the ski was held tightly when the knob was tightened. You can see in the final design that there's some holes that shouldn't be there. Those were the first holes that I drilled and I wanted the, the clamp to just be a little bit tighter so I just drilled some new holes. Since I've eliminated the T-track with the sliding T-bolts, I'm using stationary T-bolts instead. Because the base will eventually be mounted on a sawhorse, the T-bolts need to sit flush with the bottom of the board. To accommodate this, I first used a spade bit to make a hole just deep enough for the head of the T-bolt. Then I drilled a hole all the way through the center of that hole for the bolt to go through. In this case, I made the hole just slightly smaller than the T-bolt so that the T-bolt had to be screwed into the wood. This stops it from turning when the knob is tightened on the top. With all the parts assembled now, I can mount them all on the T-bolts on the base. The stand can be clamped to a workbench like this, but eventually I'm going to bolt it to a sawhorse. For previous builds, I used tough built sawhorses, but they start at $49 and the one I was using was $69, so it's a big part of the total cost. The tough built sawhorses are also a bit heavy, which is actually nice when you're waxing because it makes the stand more stable, but it's not so great when you're carrying it. Because keeping the cost down was one of the main objectives of this build, I decided to go with a sawhorse that I bought for $20. It's not as heavy and not quite as stable, but still provides an acceptable base. I used 5 16 inch bolts. And in order to have the fit tight and flush, I drilled the holes through and then used a chisel to allow the head of the bolt to sink into the wood. All that was left to do was put a large washer and a bolt on the underside and tighten the bolts. The bolt head sits just below the surface so that the ski support bases can slide smoothly back and forth over top of them. Now, the question you should be asking yourself is why I bothered using expensive T-bolts to attach the sliding bases and the center support post to the base instead of using regular bolts like the bolts attaching it to the sawhorse. The answer is that I just didn't think of it and I had some T-bolts on hand. But the next economy-minded build will just use regular bolts for everything and we'll see how that works. Setup of the L-cubed ski wax matic is similar to the other builds, but this one has a convenient handle on the sawhorse, which makes it great for carrying. The first priority is to set up the legs of the sawhorse, and once that's done, the supports are turned around from the storage position. Now it's time to get the ski and attach it to the stand. The center binding locking post is loose, which makes clicking the binding onto it fairly easy. After the binding is connected, the tip and tail ski supports are adjusted to the right length for the ski and the knobs on the sliding bases are tightened. Then the center knob is also tightened to firmly attach the ski to the stand. You can see that with this sawhorse, the stand isn't as firm as previous versions, 
However, if you put your free hand under the support when waxing, it's much more stable. This stand is a bit taller than the previous builds, which I suppose is good if you're tall, but I'm not. Still, it's not uncomfortably tall, so it works just fine. The long pivot arms also allow the stand to accommodate longer skis, although I don't have any longer skis to test with. Like always, as I finish one build, I already have ideas on how to improve the next build. One of these days, I'll get the design of the ski wax matic perfect, but until then, if you're interested, like and subscribe so that you get notified when the next video comes out. Thanks for watching and have a great ski!